now. We all know everything on No Sleep is true. But sometimes it's hard to believe someone when they're a 15-year-old girl one week and suddenly a 45-year-old father of three in the next. That's why I wanted to do something different. Over the past couple of months, I've been putting out feelers to friends, family, colleagues, and even strangers to collect and share real paranormal encounters they've experienced here in Canada. It's been a little tough going because I tend to be pretty shy out there in the real world, and it can be awkward to ask strangers if they've ever seen a ghost, but I was really surprised by the positive reception and people's openness to discussing the topic. Turns out, if you ask around, almost everyone has had some sort of paranormal encounter or another that they're willing to share. They're not all super interesting though. So, with their blessing, I'll be relaying their stories to you in this series entitled Canadian Paranormal Encounters. Okay, quick note. I typed up these accounts in the third person because, well, it felt weird to write in the first person given they happen to other people. I know it's not the norm, but, well, it makes more sense to me. The first story comes from my mother's cousin, Jean-Francois, who worked at one of Quebec's largest hydroelectric dams back in the early 1970s. He was hired by Hydro-Quebec as an engineer, and his job mainly involved patrolling the Manic 5 powerhouse, checking the valves, maintaining the turbines, making necessary repairs, that kind of stuff. He was never alone at the facility, but the workforce was fairly small, so he'd often go hours without seeing anyone else. So, before I begin his story, I just want to put things into context. If you already know how hydroelectric dams work, feel free to skip this, but if you don't, here's the short version. <laughs> Number one. A big old wall on a river, in this case the Manikugan River, to create an artificial lake. Two, build a powerhouse with turbines nearby downstream. Three, funnel water towards the top of the powerhouse and use the awesome power of gravity and water pressure to spin the turbines, which generates electricity. Four, harness the almighty power of electricity. Five, Dump the water back into the river at the bottom of the powerhouse. Now, the cool thing is, if the river has a good enough flow and is long enough, you can build multiple hydroelectric dams on it and keep juicing that same water for all it's worth. Hence, the name of the powerhouse Jean-Francois worked at, Manic 5. Manic for the river, and 5 <laughs> for the dam number. Now, technically, Due to circumstances I'm not going to get into here, Manic 4 was never built, so Manic 5 is actually the fourth dam on the river, but that's not really important here. So, explanation over, on to the story. Manic 5 had only been running for a few months when Jean-Francois was hired, and Hydro-Quebec was having trouble staffing the powerhouse. He figured it was due to the dam's remoteness. It was about three to four hours away from civilization, with only one lonely road to and from. The distance made it impractical to commute, so the staff would spend the entire week at the facility and swap out with a second crew every other week. On the phone, Jean-Francois recounted the first time he drove up to the dam. He described it as a massive concrete beer moth peeking out from an ocean of trees, like the outer wall of a castle that didn't exist. It had a weight to it that went way beyond that of its building blocks and the water it held back. He felt like it was watching him. The wall was the only thing between him and a flood of water that could wash him away forever. A guardian. A tombstone. The powerhouse was so close, if anything were to bring the damn wall down, he'd have just enough time to know death was coming, but not enough to run. I guess you could liken it to living under a volcano. He was paranoid the dam wouldn't hold. He inspected it every chance he got, searching for fissures and leaks, but never finding any. Now, intellectually, he knew it was built tough and wouldn't break, but he couldn't shake the nerves. It's like looking out over a ravine and knowing there's only a guardrail between you and certain death. 
How strong is that guardrail? Do you take it at face value that it'd hold? He barely slept his first week there, keeping his ears open for any sign of impending doom. But at first, all he heard was the ceaseless drum of water rushing through the turbines. Then, one night, as he was staring at the cold concrete ceiling in the makeshift dormitory, he heard a dripping noise. Any deviation from the norm naturally struck a chord of terror within him. It was kind of like bracing to feel the iceberg hit, and then hearing a light scraping along the hull. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Already drenched in sweat, Jean-Francois got up to investigate. The powerhouse was full of criss-crossing concrete corridors, making the source of the sound difficult to pinpoint. With nothing but a flashlight in his shaky hands, he walked up and down, straining his ears to differentiate between echo and source. It was only once he'd reached the lowest floor that the sound became loud enough for him to confirm he was headed in the right direction. He swept his flashlight left to right, until he caught something shimmering on the floor. As he approached, he realized it was a puddle coming from under a door where they'd been planning on installing a security office. Now, if it's not obvious enough, water inside a hydro dam full of electrical equipment, yes, it's not a good thing. He scurried to the nearest supply cabinet and slipped into these really thick rubber boots for insulation. He returned to the door and found the puddle had grown. Not a good sign. Unsure what he'd find inside, he cautiously opened the door, imagining a wave of water waiting to sweep him away. He found the room empty, but for a large puddle of water in the middle of the room, slowly spreading towards the corridor. This was a relief because it meant it was likely just a leaky pipe and not, well, you know, a tidal wave of doom. So there he was, in the room, searching for the source. He checked the walls, nothing. He checked the ceiling, smooth as silk. He crouched down and inspected the floor to see if it was bubbling up through a crack. Nothing. He felt a droplet hit the top of his head. Okay, he figured. He'd probably ruled out the ceiling too fast. He backed away and aimed the flashlight up, squinting to find the source. He heard a few drips, but couldn't see movement or water clinging to the surface. He looked back down to the puddle and saw a droplet splashing into it. This is the part of the story where Jean-Francois's voice began to falter. I could tell, even so many years later, it still freaked him out. There was this distinct uncertainty in his voice, as though he was both afraid to say what had happened out of honest fear, and out of fear of ridicule. Silence hung on the phone for a few moments, and then he continued. He told me he panned the flashlight back up very slowly, and that's when he saw it. There was a droplet hanging in the middle of the air. It slowly curved inward in a J-like shape, pooled, and then fell into the puddle. Jean-Francois swears it was as though it was following the curve of someone's cheek all the way down to their chin. He stood in stunned silence, as another droplet emerged out of thin air, somewhere between five and six feet in the air. Drip. 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 He ran out of there so fast he almost lost one of his boots. He ran back to the dormitory and shook one of his colleagues awake. Exhausted, confused, and more than a little grumpy, he reluctantly followed him back down not even ten minutes later. The puddle was gone, but in its place were wet bare footprints walking all around the room, up the walls, on the ceiling, and, finally, leaving out the door and disappearing halfway down the hall. 
Jean-Francois said he refused to go back to that section of the powerhouse after that night. But he heard others also found puddles leaking out from under that door. They ultimately built the security office in another location, and converted the space into a storage room, but even that wasn't enough. The room was later sealed off with concrete, under the guise that there was some sort of floor in the foundation. But they say, even today, they sometimes find puddles under the now sealed wall. I heard this story from a librarian after a tour of the rare book collection at the Library of Parliament. This was actually what spawned the idea of writing about real Canadian paranormal encounters, but since it was kind of spur of the moment, I didn't have anything prepared and didn't take notes. So what I'm trying to say is, please forgive me if I can't remember little inconsequential details like the exact floor number. I didn't take down the librarian's name either, so I can't follow up with her to verify those details, but they don't affect the story, so I hope that's okay. What happened? was the tour group and I were in one of the library sub-basements, maybe two or three floors down, where they keep the rare books. We were there maybe thirty minutes in all, and every ten minutes or so, the lights would turn off, leaving only two emergency fluorescents open on either end of this really long room. The librarian said it was nothing to worry about. We just had to move a bit to trigger the motion sensor so the lights would turn back on. It was some sort of combination energy-saving measure, as well as to help protect photosensitive material. <laughs> no biggie. As I stood there in the dark, I remember thinking how eerie the broom looked, with row upon row of old books and boxes and displays hidden under blackout drapes. You know that thrill you get when you sit around a campfire telling scary stories? That feeling was creeping up on me. That's why I lagged behind once the tour group moved on and helped the librarian pull the blanket back over a display she'd unveiled for us. And then I blurted out the question that started this all. Got any ghost stories? I was expecting a laugh or a dismissive wave of the hand. I was not expecting the apprehension on her face, or the way it looked like she was trying to swallow cement, as she gauged whether or not I was serious. I almost chickened out and rejoined my group because of the whole well, social awkwardness thing. But I've been trying to come out of my shell, so I forced myself to mumble a half-baked explanation about being into horror and how old buildings usually have stories to tell, or something like that. I forget my exact words, but whatever I said, it swayed her and got her to share something she'd experienced a few years prior. It was after hours and she was alone in the rare book collection, working late to bank vacation time. The library had been doing a bit of reorganizing, and she was hard at work sorting a box of books that had just been transferred in from storage. The rare books aren't actually organized in the same way a normal library would organize them. No Dewey Decimal System or anything like that, and most hadn't even been registered in their electronic system yet. <laughs> yes. I can just feel you librarians reading this cringe. So, it was a really slow going process. During the tour, she'd mentioned it's not uncommon for them to find books they thought lost or destroyed, and come across books they didn't even know they'd owned. The room is organized like so. A long central aisle sectioned by support beams and large wooden glass displays for the most impressive rare books. Doors on the far ends of the room, motion sensors for the lights next to each door, and rows of compact bookshelves on either side of the central aisle. If you've never heard of compact shelving units, they're basically these big metal bookshelves on tracks. Instead of the typical shelf, gap, shelf, gap, and so on and so forth, these bad boys are all squeezed together with only enough room for one gap at a time. It almost doubles storage capacity, but the downside is, if you need to consult a book in a row without a gap, you have to move all the bookshelves between it and the current gap by manually turning these three-pronged hand cranks on the side of each bookshelf like you're opening a submarine hatch. 
The librarian had been working in a row on the left side of the room when the lights automatically turned off. Since the motion sensors only pick up movement in the central aisle, she stretched her arm out and started waving blindly. When this didn't work, she stretched further, her torso now in the aisle. And that's when she caught movement from the corner of her eyes. It was just for a passing second, but she saw someone in old-timey clothing on the right side of the aisle walk by before they disappeared behind one of the support beams. The lights flickered on. Now, normally someone in old-timey clothing would have been extremely odd and a sure sign it was time to get the hell out. But the Library of Parliament actually has a changing room one floor up from the rare books collection, full of costumes of old Prime Ministers, their wives and other historical figures from a discontinued program where they'd walk around Parliament, acting out scenes for visitors. She figured a colleague was playing a prank on her so she dashed around the support beam to try and scare them first. The aisle was empty. She walked up the aisle and peered towards the bookshelves, but, like I said earlier, they were all squeezed together, and the gap on the set of bookshelves on the right side of the room was on the very end, so there was nowhere for someone to hide. Convinced she'd imagined the person, she went back to work. After all, she figured, if someone had truly been walking down the aisle, the lights would have turned back on immediately after turning off. She'd barely placed another book, when she heard the grinding shriek of old metal coming from the right side of the room, the distinctive sound of a hand crank being turned. It was accompanied by the slow scraping sound of a heavy bookshelf moving along its track. She slowly and nervously peered out expecting to see her new colleague turning the crank, but, instead, found the aisle empty again, and the noise silenced. Now, she was getting thoroughly freaked out. She retreated back into her row of books, and anxiously tried to get back to work. No sooner was she out of sight, however, than the noise picked up again. This time, she inched her way very slowly out of the row and peeked out from behind the bookshelf. The hand crank was moving. It was moving slowly, but it was moving. She couldn't understand what she was seeing. Those hand cranks can't move on their own. It takes a bit of elbow. <clears throat> It takes a bit of elbow grease to get them spinning. It's not something that, say, the wind can do. She stood there in shock for a moment, and then summoned the courage to take a closer look. With great trepidation, she crossed the aisle and walked to the shelving unit just as it clicked against the other, forming a new gap. She heard a thunk and peered into the row only to find a book on the floor leaning against the wall. She described her mental state as being in a kind of haze at that point, like she couldn't wrap her head around what was happening. So she just did what seemed logical at the time. In hindsight, it wasn't the best idea. But she walked into the row and picked up the book with the intention of putting it back in its place. Before she could, however, she saw someone standing at the foot of the gap, blocking her exit. He was wearing old clothes, just like she'd seen before, but she couldn't recognize his face. There was something about him that filled her with dread, and she only realized much later it was the fact that she couldn't see his lower body. He stepped aside and disappeared from sight, and suddenly, she heard the squeal of the hand crank, and it was moving fast. The bookshelf began sliding towards her rapidly. She screamed, dropped the book, and ran out just as the shelves were starting to squeeze against her. The aisle was empty. No sign of the crank-turning phantom. Suddenly, the hand crank on the left side of the room started spinning wildly, 
closing the gap on the row she'd been working on earlier and crushing the box of books she'd left inside. She booked it out of there like a bat out of hell. Out the nearest exit, up the first of the flights of stairs. She heard footsteps behind her, but she didn't look back. Up, 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 and finally she was on the main floor, where the night janitor was mopping. She tried to explain why she looked so scared, but he checked downstairs and said there was nothing amiss. She says she's never seen anything since then and never goes down there after hours, but sometimes. When she's at the door to the rare book collection, she'll hear the sound of the hand crank turning, even though the room is empty. I was out to lunch with my colleagues the other day, and I asked them if they'd ever experienced anything paranormal. When they asked why I was asking, I started to explain my project, but you know how conversations with larger groups of people go? Tangents come in like tides and drag topics away to a watery grave. Someone said something about writing back in college, and then someone else made a joke about construction, and splash, there goes my sandcastle. As we were walking back to the office, Dan crept up behind me. Moo! Yeah, he was cheerful, as he always is. He gestured to come closer, so I got on my tippy toes to bridge the distance. In a whisper, he proceeded to tell me he had a story for my little project. It's a creepy one, he said, but you can't tell a soul. Uh, kind of defeats the purpose, I replied. He laughed and said I could share it, just not with anyone at work. <laughs> he is hoping none of our colleagues go on Reddit. Well, no one's going to believe you anyways, he said. we just reached the office by that point, and we were running a little late, so he told me to come get him during break time. A few hours later, we were sitting by the fountain in the atrium, and he was telling me this story. Dan had been out with friends one evening in Ottawa about a month ago. He was, admittedly, a little tipsy when this happened, but nowhere near blackout drunk. He was a couple of beers in when one guy suggested they migrate to a pub a couple of streets down, where they made better wings. Being a wing connoisseur himself, he enthusiastically approved of the change in venue. The group paid their bill and staggered out the door. They were at the intersection of Sparks and Metcalf, headed down Sparks towards Bank Street. I've personally walked that stretch of road a million times, and I can tell you from experience, it's only a five minute walk. Well, eight if you're a little drunk, ten if you're really drunk, and have a limp. Between points A and B, there's just one other intersection, and that's Sparks and O'Connor. Point being, it's a very short, very easy distance to transverse, sober or otherwise. Plus, since Sparks is a shopping street close to anything but foot traffic, it's also pretty safe. Dan was lagging behind as the group arrived at the intersection of Sparks and O'Connor. He said he never actually saw the street sign, but there really was no other intersection it could have been. Like I said, there's just one street between Metcalf and Bank, and that's O'Connor. His buds crossed the street just as the pedestrian light flashed red, and he got stuck on the other side. He wanted to run over, but there was a car roaring its engine impatiently, so he waited and pulled out his phone, sending his friends, and I quote here, dank memes, you know, so they wouldn't miss him during his short absence from the group. In the corner of his eyes, he noticed the white flash of the crosswalk signal activating, and sprinted across the street while fumbling to turn off his data plan. When he finally looked up, now on the other side of the intersection, he was stunned to find his friends weren't there waiting for him. Thinking they'd gone ahead, he peered farther down the street to find them, and instantly felt his stomach drop. The whole stretch of Spark Street was completely empty. Not just devoid of his friends, but also of any other passerby one would normally find meandering around at that hour. 
his stomach's second bottom, a secret trap door bottom only he knew about, gave out as he realized he couldn't recognize any of the buildings either. Some buildings were larger, some shorter, some wider, some narrower. Where there had been a patio with chairs earlier that very same day, there was now a large man-made hole and digging equipment. Instead of the Tim Hortons where he got his coffee in the morning, there was now an abandoned looking store taking up the place of two Tim Hortons. The gym was no longer a gym. It was an empty space obscured by scaffolding. None of the streetlights were on. All of the businesses looked vacant. Less closed for the night vacant, more abandoned for twenty years vacant. At first he thought it was construction rearing its ugly head again. <laughs> They're building a light rail transit system in the area right now, so it's not uncommon to come to work one morning to find your street blocked off for construction, then go home that evening and find a big hole at another intersection. Construction explained the change in scenery, but not his missing friends. He looked around for any sign of them, listened for any drunken laugh, but got nothing. He pulled out his phone to text them, but he somehow lost his signal in the middle of downtown Ottawa, where even the crappiest service providers reached. What else could he do but keep walking and hope to rejoin them on Bank Street? It was just one block. Just one block away. He quickened his pace, but as he did, more buildings came into view, replacing the ones he'd passed. There were far too many buildings for the small stretch of road he was on. Long past where Bank Street should have been, there were bistros, gift shops, restaurants, none of which he recognized, and all of which were empty and abandoned. Some of the signs had fallen off, some of the awnings were torn in two, and some of the doors were wide open and hanging off their hinges. He glanced behind him, and he could only see more buildings stretching out into an infinite void. Confused, he stopped and asked himself the questions you'd expect someone in his situation to ask. How much did I have to drink? Is this a dream? Did someone spike my drink? As he pondered these things, he noticed something in the window of the nearest storefront. From the look of the empty and cracked displays, it seemed it had once been a jewellery store, though there wasn't even the smallest trinket left. Square in the middle of its large, store-wide window was a figure standing in the darkness, black eyes shining like a cat's in the night. Dan felt the cold grip of fear wrapping around his throat as he tried to avert his gaze, but found himself incapable of breaking his stare. It was only when the hairs at the back of his neck started to prickle from an increasing fear that something was standing behind him that he managed to turn away. When he saw the dozens of silhouettes staring back at him from the storefronts on the other side of the street, he wished he hadn't turned at all. They were everywhere, behind every window, standing at every door, sitting on every rooftop. Indistinct and uniform, melting into one another's shadows, except for those big black eyes locked on him and him alone. Dan sprinted down Spark Street, trying to get away from the spectres, but with every step they seemed to get closer. No longer content with just standing behind the windows, they began appearing on terraces, benches, next to statues. They'd move without movement, like animations in a flipbook with batches of missing pages between the actions. The street went on and on, the figures coming closer and closer, until he could feel a breath at the back of his neck. Panting breathlessly, Dan closed his eyes, swallowed hard and ran blindly. The honk of a car horn made his eyes shoot open. He stopped so abruptly, he nearly gave himself whiplash. The car drove by, momentarily illuminating the street signs. Bank Street, Spark Street. He turned around, and there was the Tim Hortons, the gym, the usual stores with their normal wares in the windows, 
and more importantly, his friends. What the hell, man? How'd you get that? I thought you were behind us, one of them said. They all looked pretty confused. He tried to explain what happened, but they were a little too drunk and way too loud to listen. So he just followed them to the pub and ate his wings in peace. Here's the thing. I couldn't tell if Dan was being serious or not. He had this big old grin on his face the whole time, like he always does. But I admit, he was a little more strained than usual. I don't know if what he said is even possible. But I think about it every time I need to walk down that part of Spark Street. I usually wind up going one block farther down to avoid it now. Just in case. This story comes straight from a friend of a friend of mine, which are words that normally sways one's legitimeter straight into the big red bullshit section. But I ask that you pull that arrow back. I did my homework and suffice to say, there's a reason I split this story into two parts, both shared here. This tale started with a friend of a friend, but there was also another witness to the events and I tracked that person down to corroborate what happened. In doing so, I got more than I bargained for. We're headed west for this one, all the way to Alberta, to hear about the last ride of the night. According to the internet, West Edmonton Mall is the largest mall in all of North America. It's so large, in fact, that it has a whole goddamn amusement park in it. That amusement park is known for three things. Being awesome, being awesome for being inside a mall, and an accident in 1986 that led to a bunch of people biting the bullet after a roller coaster car derailed and smashed into a concrete post. <sighs> yep, that went dark quick. <laughs> right, my friend's friend, Alex, was at the mall earlier this year when he heard the amusement park figuratively calling to him. It was getting late. Most stores were prepping for closing, but since there were pretty much no lines at the amusement park, he figured he had enough time to go on a few rides. He bought tickets and got on every single attraction without delay, except for the time it took for the current ride to end and their few passengers to disembark. There came a call on the speakers announcing it was time for the final rides of the night. A few of the smaller attractions were already blacked out and their operators busy sweeping. Alex checked his tickets and saw he had just enough to get on the Mind Bender, a medium-sized roller coaster that took up an entire section near the back of the park. He hurried there and arrived just as one of the employees was about to chain the entrance to the waiting line. Hey, wait! he yelled. The employee looked sour. He figured it was kind of like getting to a store a minute before closing. Technically, she couldn't turn him away, but she was just satisfied in feeling a bit bitter about letting him through. He handed her the tickets, and she closed the gate behind him, before moving on to her cleaning duties. Alex ran through the line to join up with the group, getting on the last ride of the night. But as he arrived, he found he was alone. The ride operator looked at him nervously, and mumbled something about the ride being closed. Alex replied that he'd been let through, and what the operator said in response threw him for a loop. You don't want to get on the last ride of the night, not alone. He didn't want to be rude, but he'd already spent his tickets, and God damn it, he was getting on that roller coaster. He insisted. The operator insisted right back. Alex was getting a little heated by that point. What was the operator trying to achieve? If he wanted to go home, it'd be quicker to let him on. Finally, the operator relented and opened the metal gates to let him on. Alex sat at the very front. Despite the operator warning him, it was safer at the back. He rolled his eyes and thought to himself, Man, what's this guy's problem? 
Alex sensed something was wrong almost as soon as the coaster began to inch its way up the steep incline. With every click of the gears, he felt his scarf tightening around his neck and came to the horrifying conclusion it had somehow been dragging as he got on and must have caught in the rails. He saw visions of himself getting beheaded, Final Destination style, but as he shot his hand up to try and remove his scarf, he remembered he put it in his bag earlier. There was nothing around his neck, yet he could feel an ever-tightening pressure around it. The cart stopped abruptly at the very top of the incline, and then sped down so fast it knocked the wind out of him. He tried hard to catch his breath as the coaster spun around the bend, but it was like trying to suck air through a straw. His head was aching, his throat burning, and the cart was fast approaching a loop-de-loop. As it ascended, the corners of his vision started to blacken. Alex can't remember what happened after that. The next thing he knew, he was taking in a deep intake of air, like the first gasp after a dive, and could feel firm hands clasped on his shoulders. He opened his eyes and found the ride operator standing over him, while he was slouched in his seat like a drunken grandpa in his armchair. He was dizzy, confused, and his head felt like it was about to split open. The operator was very kind and patient with him, helping him to his feet and asking if he was all right. Words felt like cotton balls lodged in his throat. They melded together and came out in incomprehensive mumbles. The operator escorted him towards the ride exit, passing by the booth with the ride photos. What? The hell is that? was all Alex could muster when he saw his photo. Any other words came out jumbled. What the hell is that? The operator leapt over the counter, shut the monitors, and then ushered Alex out without another word on either of their parts. Alex stood at the entrance of the dim mall. A storefront after storefront pulled down their metal grates and locked up for the night. The words, what the hell is that, played out in his head as he tried to make sense of what he'd seen on those monitors. The aft reimagine of his photo felt like a blow to the head. He was on the right, unconscious, but not alone. Something some sort of pale form with pure white eyes, was standing in the seat behind him, hands tight around his neck. When he got home that night and looked in the mirror, he found the distinct marks of fingerprints around his throat. And that was Alex's side of the story. And on the phone, he sounded convinced that's how it really went down. I, however, felt the need to do a bit of extra digging. It's not that I didn't believe he believed what he was saying, it's that his account came following a sudden loss of consciousness, which slightly dampers the reliability of his statements. I've passed out twice in my life, and both times it was immediately preceded and followed by this weird, dreamlike state. So, while I don't discount his account, I wanted to do my due diligence and see if anyone else could back it up. Did he imagine the phantom in his photo and tightening around his throat? I wanted to hear from the other witness, the operator who'd warned him not to get on the ride. He had to know something. Turns out the guy's name is Tyler, and he was a lot harder to track down than I initially thought. Even though this happened only a few months ago, most of the evening employees at the amusement park are students, which means there's a pretty high turnover rate, not to mention the operators rotate rides, so I was looking for a needle in a haystack that might not even be in that haystack anymore. Thankfully, one of the employees I emailed, big shout out to Emily by the way, was super helpful and offered to ask around for me. It took about a week, but she got me in touch with Tyler, and this is his side of the story. According to Tyler, who'd been working at the amusement park for a couple of years, what Alex saw on his photo that evening 
was true, and it wasn't the first time something similar had happened. It was always the last ride of the night, and only when a single rider was on. Thankfully, those conditions were met very infrequently, but the times they were met, he was told to keep quiet, escort the customer out, and delete the evidence. The first time it happened, Tyler honestly thought it was a joke. You know, some sort of hazing ritual, or maybe a weird mystery customer test thing. But then he saw the very real marks on that victim's throat, and immediately called the manager. After the victim had been escorted out, he was told never to mention it again. It kept happening on his watch, to the point he got pretty good at handling the situation, and started requesting that ride. Why scar some 16-year-old kid working their first job when he could handle the pressure? He became close with one of the managers, and one night they went out for drinks. One thing led to another, and he found the guts to ask her about the ride. From the get-go, she made it clear he was never to tell anyone else about it, and that she'd deny it if he did. He agreed, but, well, I guess he's gone back on that promise now, eh? Anyways, she explained that only two years after the 1986 accidents, late in 1988, some teenage punk thought it'd be a fun idea to mess with the safety harness by putting his bag under his shirt, so when they snapped the harness in, he could remove the bag and have some slack. For the record, this was not on the same ride Alex had ridden on. It was one that didn't have a loop-de-loop, -loop, so while doing this was in no way a smart idea, it wasn't, well, clearly suicidal or anything. Security cameras showed that, when the ride took off, the kid pulled the backpack out and stood up in his car. You know those signs that say keep your legs and arms inside that vehicle at all times? They're there for a reason. There are all manners of gears, pillars, and support beams all over roller coasters, and if you stretch out too much, you could hit them. Now, imagine someone standing on the kind of ride designed to be sat in. The teen was fine at first, but somewhere in the middle of the ride, his head struck an overhead beam, and he fell unconscious in the car. Now, this is where the incident from 1986 I mentioned at the very start comes into play. See, apparently one of the night managers saw what happened, and immediately ran to the coaster's unloading platform. You'd think he would have wanted to help, that he could have called for an ambulance. But instead, he told the ride operator to shut the gate and keep a lookout. Another incident at the amusement park so soon after the first could have shut it down, and they would have lost their jobs. They brought the unconscious kid out of the back into the break room, and just kind of waited for a bit. Thankfully, the kid regained consciousness not too long after and they sent him packing with a big old lump to the noggin. They didn't think about it, until they saw on the news a few days later that that very same kid died of a blood clot in the brain. They knew if they just called an ambulance, he would have been okay. Tyler says the ghostly figure is that kid's vengeful spirit trying to get back at the manager and ride operator who let him die. So guys, if you're ever in the West Edmonton Mall at night, and you want to go on the roller coaster, just make sure you're not alone on the last ride of the night. I've got to say, for some reason, this next story really shook me. Which is kind of odd given I was twice removed from the events. What I mean by that is, I didn't even hear about it from the source. I heard about it from his widow. I really hesitated on sharing this one with you guys, since I couldn't interview the person it happened to, but it was too creepy not to share it. So here it is. There's a man with a hat staring at me from the sidewalk. Ashley, Jonathan's widow, 
remembered him speaking those exact words. It's not that they were so striking or so outside the norm that she committed them to memory, but he spoke them every time she saw him over the course of an entire week. That's just the streetlight, she'd reply patiently as she fluffed his pillows and gave him his meds. Streetlights don't wear hats. It was a game, she figured. She didn't know what he expected from the exchange, but it had to have been some sort of game. He'd been diagnosed with dementia not even a year prior, after she started noticing little things, like him trying to eat using the wrong side of his fork. His condition had degenerated rapidly. She caught him cussing out a coat hanger once and cowering in fear at the sight of their eldest son. She could usually if not shake him from his delusions, at least calm him down. And when it came to the man with a hat, there was no emotion, no wild look in his eyes, just a flat statement of fact, as though he were testing her, or maybe himself. Mistaking an object for something else was one thing, but no amount of books and research could have prepared her for the day Jonathan changed his tune. The man with the hat is on the grass now. She tried not to let her apprehension show on her face. There was nothing in the yard that could have been mistaken for a man in a hat. No streetlight, no bus, no fountain, nothing. She wasn't afraid of the idea of the man in the hat, but of the fact that it was a sign his condition was deteriorating even further. At her age, it was tough to take care of herself and him, so when he said that, it reinforced her fear she was going to have to place him into a care facility, and that meant she'd be left in that big house all alone. Ashley couldn't bring herself to do it. She wanted to delay the inevitable for as long as she could, so she just calmly told him there was no man with a hat in the yard, and she continued to tell him this over and over and over again. The man with the hat is by the garden now, he said a few days later. She told him there was no man with a hat. When the imaginary man moved from the garden to the foot of their back porch, Ashley stopped correcting Jonathan and simply pulled down the blinds. <laughs> he can't mistake anything for a man with a hat if he can't see outside, she figured. Ashley checked on Jonathan a few hours later and his usual monotone comment about the man in the hat suddenly became laced with fear. The man with the hat is on the bottom step. He couldn't see outside. The blinds were still pulled, which was proof enough he was making it up. As the day progressed, Jonathan became more and more distraught. The man with the hat is on the second step. The man with the hat is on the third step. When she wasn't in the room to hear him say it, he'd scream it at the top of his lungs until she came and acknowledged she'd heard him. One night, he woke up screaming that the man with the hat was at the window. She was shaken, not sure how to handle her husband. He kept repeating it over and over and over again like a broken record. The man with the hat is at the window, at the window, at the window. The man with the hat is at the window, at the window, at the window. The fear in his cataract eyes was real. But the man in the hat couldn't be. She opened the blinds and showed him the empty window. But he insisted he could see him and that he was staring back in anger. She sat at his side, trying to soothe him until he fell asleep, and, come morning, she made an appointment with a nursing facility. The man with the hat is in the room, he told her, as she tried to spoon-feed him breakfast. He hadn't been eating much, not since his imaginary friend had reached the back porch. She didn't like to leave him alone, not in his condition, but they needed groceries, and none of their kids could come over to watch Jonathan. Ashley checked on him one last time before she left. He was trembling, 
eyes locked on the wall in front of him. The man with the hat is at the foot of my bed, he whispered in a stressed hush. She promised she'd be back soon and put the phone on his bedside table. Her son, the smart one, had rigged it so that if she called, it would pick up automatically and go on speaker. Like a long-distance baby monitor, she explained. Ashley hadn't been gone for even half an hour when she got this terrible feeling at the pit of her stomach, like something was wrong. She fumbled through her purse, trying to find her phone, and then called home. The call connected, but before she could even say anything, she heard her husband screaming, The man with the hat is standing over me! His words were followed by a guttural, almost animalistic scream. The line cut abruptly, and when she tried to call back, she got a busy signal. She abandoned her shopping cart and drove back home, speeding the whole way there. Jonathan was already cold by the time she arrived. The paramedics soon whisked him away, and the hospital pronounced him dead of a massive coronary heart attack, unrelated to his dementia. Now, Ashley doesn't believe the man with the hat was real, per se. She was quick to dismiss the idea of him being a ghost or a demon or anything of the sort. When I pressed her and asked her what she thought it was, she looked out of the window and went quiet for a bit. You know how animals know when they're about to die? She asked, not giving me time to answer. My cats all found a warm space to die when their time came. Maybe they can see death coming. Their bodies know it's time, and it makes them see something, so they know to get ready. Maybe every living thing has their own version of a man in a hat, but most of us can't see it. Maybe that's what the Reaper is. Not a monster, not an entity to come take you away, but a vision, a sign we see on the highway of life letting us know it's time to get off at the next exit.